still there? Yep. Uh, okay. okay. Hi, I'm Charlie Wilson. This is Think Tech Radio and Think Tech TV. Uh, today we have a, a panel. We're going to discuss gun control. And one of our questions, our key question is, are we asking the right questions when it comes to gun control? Are we looking at the right things when we, when we look at what we can do in the legislature to move things forward? Uh, we have four guests with us tonight. Peter Carlisle uh, probably needs no introduction, our, our former mayor, a uh, former prosecuting attorney. Uh, he'll be our, our first person up here. After that, we're gonna uh, hear from Nadine Onodera. Uh, on my left, uh, Nadine has been uh, a proponent of gun control issues uh, for quite a few years now. She's the chapter head of Parents of Murdered Children and uh, wears a few hats here too. And so we're gonna uh, let her follow Peter. Uh, they're basically gonna be speaking in, in, in favor of gun control. And uh, on the opposite side, we have Harvey Gerwig at the end of the table in the yellow shirt. Harvey is the president of Hawaii Rifle Association, a frequent speaker at the legislature on, on behalf of firearms issues and also a firearms instructor. Uh, seated to my left, we have Dr. Maxwell Cooper. He's a local plastic surgeon and he also functions as the le legislative liaison for Hawaii Rifle Association. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all. Thank you for, for coming in today. Thanks for having us. Um, we're gonna start right off with uh, Peter Carlisle. Um, Peter, with regard to Hawaii firearms laws, how happy are you with where we are now and what do we need to do in the future to reduce firearms violence? What would you like to see happen in the legislature? Well, where we are right now, Charlie, is actually a position that's enviable by many. Uh, we have the lowest level of firearm violence uh, in the United States, and we have a couple of very, very severe restrictions on uh, firearm laws. Uh, so we are a, a tough, uh, uh, tough firearm state in a lot of different ways. Uh, but more can be done, and I think some of the things that we may be not thinking about, we probably should be thinking about. Uh, it occurred to me, and it was during uh, a, a sort of a minor debate uh, between Harvey and Max, uh, that we don't allow people to get in cars and drive uh, when they're intoxicated. And that's obviously for the safety of everybody around them as well as themselves. And it, when that was said, for some reason, a, a sort of a, a thought came into my head, and I really don't know whether it's a viable one. And that is, is that if we have people who are in possession of loaded firearms while they're intoxicated, uh, why should we allow that? Uh, and isn't that something that's dangerous? And is this a cause not only of criminals killing people, but of accidental firearm deaths, uh, as well as murder suicides and a whole series of other things? And frankly, my thought about this, and I haven't developed it sufficiently, but something that I'd like to talk about at some point with people is, why shouldn't we make it illegal for people who are intoxicated to carry or have in their possession uh, loaded firearms that are ready to go? And uh, that's something that I think we need to discuss and develop, and that's sort of taking the spotlight off of the firearm and on the person who is in possession of the firearm, and certainly I think if we look at some of the violence that we've had in schools and the young people who are getting uh, in possession of firearms, uh, under 21, I I'm not sure that that shouldn't be very much a, a zero tolerance type thing. Uh, I think it's very dangerous, particularly if somebody is under 21 and they're intoxicated, uh, certainly when they're driving and certainly some of their conduct. But if you take a look at somebody who's under 21 and now has a loaded gun, uh, I'm not sure that that's at a level of sophistication or neurological or brain development or basically growth for somebody to, to be going through that stage of their life intoxicated with a gun in their hand. Okay, could I ask you a quick question? Sure. It seems to me like we would have three categories of person here. We would have uh, the person who is uh, the firearms owner who goes through the process of, of getting a permit to acquire and uh, is the legal owner, uh, usually the registered owner of a firearm. Second, we would have people who live in the household, uh, which would include children who may be quite young, or maybe teenagers, maybe older children living in the house. Um, third, we would perhaps need to look at people who 
for want of a better term, I'll call professionally armed persons, such as uh, police officers, um, military, whatever. And uh, in the case of police officers, I believe most police officers are armed when they're off duty uh, the vast majority of the time, assuming they're not swimming or, or, or such. So uh, that would seem like a little bit of a difficulty to legislate. Uh, I think you're, you're absolutely correct. I think you'd have to look at all of those people. I, I mean, who is irresponsibly leaving lot firearms around a household? I would think that if you have any small children, uh, leaving a loaded gun somewhere is just a, an invitation to a problem. Anybody who has teenagers by the same, uh, the same uh, yardstick, that would also be irresponsible. Uh, and police officers, I think what we ought to do is find out what they do, what they tell police officers, because it's not unusual, it's perfectly legal for police officers when they're off duty to drink. Uh, what does the police department expect of them if there is a situation when the firearm should be uh, utilized, or is there a, a, a blanket prohibition of a, an officer who is uh, at a legal, legal level of intoxication uh, responding to a crime scene with a loaded weapon? And I don't know the answer to that question, and uh, it wouldn't take much more than a phone call to the police department to see how they've handled that in the past. I suspect you'd have an easier time getting an answer than any of us would. Um, I don't think it would be wildly difficult to uh, call in a favor or two on that one. That, that would be a very interesting question to have on, to answer to see if there's a policy on that. Do any of other panelists have a, a question to follow up with Peter? Uh, I think we all agree that alcohol and guns don't belong together. Right. I, one of the primary rules we teach in our firearm right. safety classes. Yeah. You, 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 you know, and, and I think the fact that that's a, an, an area of common ground uh, speaks of hope mm -hmm. for us doing something cooperatively that's going to deal with, uh, you know, situations that we've had involving a horrific gun violence uh, and uh, maybe asking a few extra questions as to why we aren't doing some of these step forwards together rather than always being at each other's throats uh, hostile to uh, uh, the positions we take. I think if we were to examine that type of area, uh, I think that there might very well be uh, an opportunity for us to reach common ground and to get some sort of solution that uh, we all agree is perhaps different, perhaps is going to require a lot of thinking, yeah. uh, but has a, a potential of a very significant not only ramifications practically, but also policy level. Peter, I'm not sure we need another law. We have lots of laws on the books, and we've got one that pretty well covers this, both civilly and criminally. It's called the absolute liability law for firearms owners. Mm -hmm. If I have a firearm that's registered in my name or that I possess, if it injures anyone or causes property damage, I'm absolutely liable, criminally and civilly. Uh, I'm not sure we so need to know. So if somebody comes into the house and steals your firearm and goes out and shoots somebody, you're absolutely liable for that criminally? Unless I have uh, reported the firearm as stolen, or there are some other exceptions, if I had no way of knowing that the firearm was stolen, I've been on the mainland for three months, or if the firearm was lawfully discharged. That means a person in my household who doesn't have a registration for the firearm there, if they have to use it in a lawful manner, then they're excused from absolute liability. Otherwise, you're on the hook. Well, that doesn't strike me as what I would consider to be absolute liability. Absolute liability to me is uh, essentially if it happens, such as uh, sexual contact with somebody who's under the age, under a particular age, you're absolutely liable. So that's, if that's absolute liability, it has a certainly, as far as you've described it, a whole bunch of exceptions. Well, that's why you were a prosecutor for so many years. <laughs> that, that, that would be a very fine distinction here because uh, uh, if a criminal breaks into your home and steals a firearm, I would say that unless you have done something that, that is negligent, probably it would be difficult to find you liable in a, in a court. On the other hand, if you left the doors wide open and uh, the gun and the ammunition out, that would be a different story. But, and the and same thing with, with children. Some, some children probably are okay around firearms and others likely are not. And uh, I know some people teach their kids early on and a lot of us grew up in an earlier time where there were firearms around the house probably and people had access to it and it wasn't a problem. So there, there's a, a cultural change and other changes that we have not adequately addressed here and what's, what's going on in schools and such. Um, and, and, and then the other thing that I think we do have to look at are, are things that are, are clearly perhaps what I would describe as absolute liability and that is anybody who owns a cliff uh, that has uh, uh, more than the uh, allowed number of 
uh, bullets in it. Uh, obviously, we had a, a terrible example of that in the Xerox massacre. Uh, the person had illegal clips. Uh, they could shoot 17 more people and with one clip. And uh, Uisugi, in the process, in the second clip, screwed up and uh, jammed a, a bullet, was able to clear it, stuff another one in, and then uh, empty his bullets, uh, every last one, into the people who were there uh, helpless. So uh, we know what it's like to have uh, a very, very easily concealable weapon with too many clips and easily inter exchanged and uh, have it have absolutely uh, horrific, tragic consequences. So. Uh, if you want absolute liability for that, you've got me smiling all the way. I, I think Peter, you... question about that. Why wasn't he prosecuted on his magazines? On what? Why wasn't he prosecuted for breaking the law with his magazines? I'll tell you why he wasn't. Do you know what life without possibility of parole and 327 uh, uh, years uh, consecutive to it? So why it was enough just that he tried, that he successfully murdered people with his firearms? Why do you need a law about magazines then if he... You had a law against well, killing people. Somebody who has tried to kill somebody who's not so successful, or somebody who's trying to assault somebody who wasn't so successful as Louis Sudi was. But clearly, it wasn't the magazine that was the problem in that case. It was seven dead people. Right. He didn't run out of bullets, and he didn't run out of magazines. He just ran out of people to shoot. That's exactly correct. I think I'd be, be worried, uh, even if there was only one bullet in the gun, if it's used to kill somebody, clearly, you know, that's, that's something we all want to avoid. Uh, Correct, and if he had only one bullet in the guns, there would have been enough people in the one bullet in a gun. Right, uh, right. And he had nothing to back it up, and there would have been six or seven people who would have been all over him in a second. Right. Harvey looks like he wants to jump in here. Yeah, Let's Peter, I, I think you said something that really hits the nail on the head. All those defenseless people, and they were truly defenseless. And why were they defenseless? Because the anti-gun folks, including you, keep fighting self-protection, the CCW. Uh, conceal carry law. Even uh, more so, uh, they were uh, unprotected because Xerox had a company rule against firearms at work. That, that, that's an interesting comment because I, I think that we've seen some of that in some of the recent shootings. Uh, uh, I'm thinking of the, the theater massacre. Or, um, the, Aurora. the creation of gun-free zones promotes mass killings. Okay, you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Oh, the Colorado Theater was one. Uh, there are several theaters in uh, the area that do allow concealed carries, mm -hmm. but this particular theater prohibits it, and the gunman knew that. Okay. Okay, may I? I don't in? think that, yeah, I would suspect that that applies to certain different locales. It certainly hasn't applied in Honolulu. Uh, if you take it Honolulu, yes, you can look at the Xerox massacre, but if you take a look at gun violence in general, uh, we are uh, admirably free of it, and we certainly aren't armed to the teeth everywhere we go. Okay. We're, we're microbly crime-free here, and that's due to our population demographics, not the strictness of our laws. We have law-abiding, peaceful people here, but that's going to change. It is changing, and uh, probably we need to think about lots of advice that uh, if you do have concealed carry, uh, shell issue, uh, the uh, incidence of mass killings drops by about 90%. Mm. The, the, uh, there's a point my dad used to always make, and that was that there are points over which reasonable persons will disagree, and I think that this is going to be one of those. That's going to be a real sticky point. Nadine looks like she wants to jump in with a point here. Yes, well, I'm with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think I'm going to uh, okay. uh, bail out if that's okay. Yes, we thank you very much for your participation. and uh, Thanks, Peter. Uh, well, my pleasure, thank gang. You. It's good talking to right. you guys yeah, again. Take care. Bye-bye. Aloha. Aloha. Yes, I do have a point. The night that my son was murdered in my home in Hawaii Kai, we had three guns in the house. We had an M1 carbine, we had a 12 gauge shotgun, and a 22 rifle. And so I, I guess my point is that even when you would go into a, a theater with people that had guns, I had that false sense of security that most gun owners have, that I've got guns, therefore I'm safe. Uh, we also had a pit bull in the house. Uh, I lived in an all-male household. My son that was murdered fought golden gloves. Uh, you know, I just ha I lived in the safest state and one of the nicest areas on a dead-end cul-de-sac surrounded by marina. You know, I had absolutely no way of ever even conceiving the thought that we were in any kind of peril at all. My son had fallen asleep watching TV. 
Uh, in fact, he was watching Hill Street Blues, a nice law <laughs> and order <laughs> show. And um, I, I had really no sense of danger at all. Oh. And uh, my neighbor across the way was a deputy attorney general, and he was heavily armed. In fact, uh, it took three hand trucks loaded to the top to take his arsenal out of his home. And um, he's the prime suspect in my son's murder. And well, Nadine, you bring out a point that we emphasize in our classes about personal defense in the home. You have to have an awareness, and the gun is a last resort. You, you need, as you did partially, you had dogs in the house, the way I understand it, but he was home alone sleeping. Uh, we also uh, suggest that the people be aware enough to perhaps install perimeter alarms in their homes. But they didn't exist at that time. Right. And they I, did I was yeah. But the dog, the dog is, a, is probably one of the best perimeter alarms. Yes, and the dog was injured that night too. So, um, it, it, but he survived. And, but he had the uh, skull fracture that was, uh, the vet described, uh, not knowing that our son had been murdered, was looking at the x-rays and said, gee, if I didn't know any better, that looks like the perfect impression of a gun butt where it had crushed in this dog's skull where somebody had just you know, come down uh, with the gun. So, I, like I said, it, I had that false, it, it is a false sense of security that gun ownership gives you. I think you may even relax a little more and be less uh, wary when you think you have all your bases covered. And it, it's not necessarily so. <laughs> and. You know, I, I've spent many years now working with victims. I worked with the police department for quite a few years as a domestic violence counselor, and I've seen probably the worst of the worst. And I really respect, I'm the only female here, and I respect the position that a lot of women are in that um, are d victims of domestic violence. And where statistically it proves out that they're more likely to be harmed with their own gun than, if, than they are to protect themselves. And so I, I have such mixed feelings <laughs> about mm -hmm. this, this issue. I was dragged into it. I, I didn't grow up uh, being a gun control advocate. I, I grew up on a ranch uh, by southwestern people who I can remember it was just a rite of passage to get a gun for Christmas. It was just so the mm -hmm. best thing that could happen. It meant your parents really trusted you to have a gun. And on a ranch, we our property, our ranch abutted the Olympic Olympic National Park, and we had cougars. My mom had a grocery store, and a bear came in her store and ate cookies. You know, and she was everybody got a big kick out of uh, the story mm -hmm. making the paper about the bear shopping in her store and went straight for the cookie aisle. And, and also a bear came to our sliding glass door on the ranch and my mom was standing on the other side and the bear saw its reflection in the door and just came charging up and, and knocked itself out when it <laughs> hit the, the door that uh, my dad had built the house, so apparently he built it pretty well. And, um, but you know, we had cougars and uh, all kinds of things. So, and if we had an injured animal that we had to put down so it wasn't suffering. I didn't grow up being afraid of guns. I'm not afraid of guns. Like I said, we had, uh, my, my kids all learned to shoot. We, we weren't in that, um, I've been called the, the great gun grabber. <laughs> and I don't even, I don't even, I don't see myself in that role. And yet, as we were talking earlier about having children and the, the legal and civil re responsibilities, criminally and civilly, about having gun ownership, I can remember fighting these very same people at the legislature when we had the Kids and Guns Bill, as it was called, where it was illegal for you to go, you couldn't go out from the hospital doorway with a newborn baby unless you put it into a approved safety seat with a proper, um, properly installed before they would let you take your own child home. But you could walk into the house and have a loaded gun on the coffee table with toddlers around and that wasn't considered child endangerment until we fought to get these laws through. And I'm very proud and very happy of the fact you that we You should be. Consequently, we have a pretty good storage laws in this state. So, good job. But, but I, uh, Harvey's eyebrows went up about 
two clicks there. When you said <laughs> one thing, though, I'd, li I'd like to ask him what he thought about your statement that a woman's more likely to be injured with her own gun than defend herself. My understanding of that, of that statement is it's a made-up statistic. Well, we'll go on both from, sides. It comes from the Brady Bunch, who make up statistics weekly on, you know, to, to support their side. As does I, Fox I don't News. believe that's the case. <laughs> In fact, the crime statistics are published by the federal government show that a person who defends himself with a firearm is less likely to be injured or killed than someone who tries to flee or submits. And that's from the FBI statistics. I, I guess I would have a question here also is... I stand corrected. Okay. Is the issue really... You, you mentioned growing up around guns and being comfortable around them. Uh, is it really the gun that was the issue? It, it, it seems to me like we have an increasing level of violence that, that seems to be either acceptable or a, a problem with mel mental illness where, where more people are taking it out. And I'm also a little bit wondering if, if having the gun around is like putting gasoline on a flame. If you have a set of other conditions which are met and you introduce a gun into the situation, well, if the gun wasn't there, you know, might your, your son or some other person yeah. have, been, have been injured with a baseball bat or a knife or oh. Two Something points else. that you brought up. Okay. Sorry to interrupt you, but are that the suspect in my son's um, murder uh, was a had a severe drinking problem, mm -hmm. and was on mind-altering medication. There was a physician um, who was teaching at the University of Hawaii that was doing brain chemistry research, and at the time this happened, he was this man was. Uh, one of his subjects that he was giving one course of medication and then going to another and so I honestly don't think the man had a clue what he was doing that night and in fact uh, he quite obviously had intended to kill my husband but he was so drunk and so stoned that night on mind-altering drugs that he didn't realize until later that he had killed my son and then he subsequently stalked me, and so I wasn't just on the gun issue, I helped get a stalking law through the legislature. And so there were, but I didn't, like I said, I wasn't, mm -hmm. uh, had no idea that this would be where my life would go or the, mm -hmm. how my son's life would end up. And I'm, I used to say when we got started many, been almost three decades now since my son was murdered. It'll be 30 years this December 9th. And I started off saying that I, my English teacher wouldn't like this, but I, it was a double negative. I'd say, I, I don't know who it is that won't get killed because of maybe something that we did. And so that would please me to know that it may be uh, as a tribute to him that there was somebody who did not die. And that was my only aim was to make our community a safer place. Well, maybe we can focus on some common uh, common sense solutions here. One of the points that, that uh, uh, Peter Carlisle brought up and Harvey has also mentioned was uh, antidepressants and violence. And alcohol clearly is another factor in here that uh, people's inhibitions are down if they're, if they're drinking. So um, maybe we should turn that over to Harvey and, and let him. I know you had some very interesting research well, there's a lot of research that shows that all of these, or not all, but almost all of these mass killings, the, the perpetrators were on some form of psychotropic drug. They were on Prozac or, or one of those types of drugs. Right down the line, I've got five pages single spaced of incidents where the people were found after they had killed one, two, five, twenty people, that they were on these drugs. And we're finding more and more research about to start. That's where our focus needs to be, and I think in the case of your son, very much that somebody that was on drugs, on alcohol, was probably known to the police, he probably had registered firearms, should, the police should have known that somebody like that was, was on these drugs. That's where I think we need to, to focus. It, to me, and to HRA and to NRA, it's not a gun issue, it's a mental health issue. In all these cases, no one with sound mental health values goes out and does these things. And they may have been borderline, then they put them on these drugs, and apparently it's the going on and the coming off of the drugs that is the trigger point. 
Are Harvey, you? I'm going to have to jump in here a little bit. Okay. And disagree with my colleague here, the president of the Hawaii Rifle Association. <laughs> I, I, I was uh, able to review a couple of very good control studies that Charlie uh, provided me. Uh, what you've been talking about is more anecdotal uh, th and using anecdotes, this person killed, this person was on antidepressants, uh, that's an association but not cause and effect. So I'm not sure that the police need to know everybody in the state who's on an antidepressant. During the legislative session this year, uh, there was a mental health bill uh, which was opposed by uh, the uh, psychiatrists and the psychologists here because by and large, most of their patients require these medications and they're not dangerous. The control studies that Charlie provided me show that in, uh, they're pretty good, some of them from British and some from the American, uh, and there are specific drugs that are, that are, are uh, identified as where this is more likely. But again, the controlled group on uh, these drugs reported only about a 1% incidence of any kind of violent behavior, and they went everywhere from, from just being aggressive to murder in these areas, whereas 99% of the patients on these drugs were presumably getting some therapeutic benefit from it. And I'm not sure those people need to be identified to the police department. I wasn't suggesting we do that. You and I had a, a discussion about that previously, that if people have firearms and they recognize that if they go to seek mental help, they're going to be turned into the police department, the result is they're not going to go. And that's a worse scenario than that I think we're in now. But I, I still feel that it's a mental health issue more than it is a gun issue. When you look at the national statistics of how, how people are killed throughout the nation, there are so many other things besides guns. Leaving cars aside, uh, there's what, 25 to 30,000 people killed every year with cars. Leaving that aside, um, hammers, blunt instruments, baseball bats, knives, fists, feet, Doctors. And what? Doctors. Do well, because you're here, I was going to respect <laughs> you and not bring that up. Doctors kill a lot of people every year, but, you know, there are so many other things. But it there's, isn't a gun there's, issue. There's one thing that you need to consider in all of this, and, and it goes for doctors especially. You have to consider the risk versus the benefit levels. And dying from medical intervention is a lot lower risk than benefiting from medical intervention. If it wasn't for modern medicine, well, I wouldn't be here twice already. Well, I, I have a point that just came to my attention uh, recently because my, um, both my son and my grandson got new jobs starting April 1st, promotions. And, and, uh, but both of them, in order to get a new job, had to have a complete background check, a financial check. They had to be drug tested. You know, there, were, there was this enormous testing that went on just to get a job. And, or if you buy a house, you've got to have all this background check done on you. But we've fought and fought and fought having any kind of background check. We're still fighting it nationally about having background checks to get a gun. It's just, it's, to me, it's ludicrous. That, and most, thank God, most of the nation is seeing it that way. That well, Nadine, you'll be happy to know that we support the current Senate Bill 69 version, which uh, requires the police to do a background check. They're already doing it anyway. We like background checks because uh, uh, I think about 3% of people who apply uh, here in Hawaii for a permit or to register a gun are denied, uh, and that's good. We like that. What we don't like is permanent records necessarily that lead the police to come take my guns if they think, oh, gee, Dr. Cooper's probably getting old and senile and off the wall with his comments on the radio show, so maybe we better have a look at his collection. Or for nationwide confiscation. The nation is very unsettled about nationwide confiscation. There was a, there was the a bill, bill in the Senate this, this year in Hawaii to confiscate so-called assault weapons, look, military lookalikes. Confiscate. And there was no, there was no compensation. Just take. I don't. The government can't even collect all the taxes. We all. <laughs> well, HP didn't didn't like the idea of collecting all the guns either. They didn't know where they'd store them. Maybe one of you could could clarify this point here because uh, we've heard the term assault weapon bandied about now for for more than a decade. There was a, a crime bill in the Clinton administration. 
uh, which imposed some restrictions. Yet when you try to look that up, what you find is that the term assault weapon is a military term and what is defined by the legislature as an assault weapon is, is very different. Uh, maybe one of you could clarify that? I'll start. Assault weapon was a very, very clever invention, uh, word-wise, by the Brady campaign. Uh, they took uh, the wrong definition for something and, and made it a household word. It was great uh, public relations or propaganda more preferred as you say the, the first assault weapons were introduced around World War II. The German uh, MP44, I think it was, M44, was a, a small caliber for rifle, a carbine, that fired uh, full auto or semi-auto selected fire. And that's the definition. The artificial definition that was used to implement a ban nationally uh, some years ago, that's sunset now, uh, ascribes a number of pretty much cosmetic uh, characteristics that are arbitrarily uh, assigned, like a bayonet lug, a detachable box magazine, not the clip that Peter was referring to, the correct term is his magazine, uh, muzzle brake, uh, pistol grip, uh, shroud to keep your hand from burning, those things. And if you have a certain number of those, which keeps diminishing uh, as a more restrictive gun legislation gets proposed, then you have what's called an assault weapon. But uh, oh, the other handy thing about it is that it lets people confuse full auto with semi-auto. Semi-auto, one pull of the trigger results in one round fired, fired just, just like a, a revolver actually does also. But uh, a machine gun will empty itself uh, with one pull of the trigger. So it's a, more of a law enforcement tool. They're not allowed in Hawaii. They never have been. Uh, the Constitution, uh, I'm sorry, the, the uh, you know, state constitution during statehood uh, said no machine guns, no cannon, uh, artillery, uh, and they haven't been allowed except for military and police whose duties require that. So not every soldier has one, and uh, only the SWAT team in Hawaii has them. Could we, could we clarify here, could you Tell us what is the military definition of an assault weapon versus what is the legislative definition. You're, you're just describing that there are features that the legislature uses to define, quote unquote, an assault weapon under the law, but the military has a different uh, definition, correct? It does. It means it's a machine gun that it fires until it's empty when you hold the trigger down. Uh, most designs have a uh, selector switch, a device that turns on uh, uh, full auto fire, but some machine guns are, an, are not adaptable to semi auto fire. They just fire automatically until they're empty. Okay, so an, an assault weapon to the military is uh, a fully automatic, it's a machine gun, whereas in the uh, legislative terms, they're defining something as an assault weapon, which is not a machine gun. So, so it basically. It only looks like the military gun, it okay. doesn't function like the military gun. Okay, so it looks like the military uh, gun. It looks like it because it has the flash hider you mentioned. The artificial features that the okay, the, the under the law make it. It's, okay. Somebody told me once, you know, this is not a reason or logic, this is law we're talking yes. about. Yes, yes. <laughs> so you might ask, well, why are the guns like the AR-15 so popular in civilian hands? And then you look at how many people have come out of the military and been trained to use that particular firearm. So they know how it works. They come into the civilian world, they can't buy that gun, in Hawaii anyway. Some states do have full autos. Hawaii is not one of them. So they already have familiarity with how to operate that particular firearm. And so they're drawn to that as a firearm that they would like to use for whatever purposes, sporting, target shooting, hunting, whatever. Mm -hmm. And that's been true through all of the, the firearms that the military has had and turned into, into civilian hands after conflict. So you sure. look at the old bolt action guns, you look mm -hmm. at the M1 Garand, the M1 Carbine, which you mentioned early, the guys come back from service in the military, not necessarily war, but service. They were trained in those firearms and they like to use the civilian component, which is semi-auto. So basically what you're saying is that if, if somebody uh, if somebody goes into the military, maybe they have firearms training, maybe they know nothing about firearms, they go into the military, they go through a, a course of study that teaches them how to use a, a, a specific firearm, then they come out, they're more likely to want what they've been trained on, what, what 
firearm they know. So that's the reason for the, the popularity of, of the... I think so. And, and okay. the military buys good firearms. And mm -hmm. so, you know, they're, they're good arms for, for the purposes that the civilians are going to use them, whether it's self-defense or hunting or shoot, sport shooting. They're safe. They work all the time. Uh, they fire a cartridge that's effective. Uh, so the reason that the 30 6 cartridge is known around the world, probably the most commonly known, is because American soldiers used that in World War I. Okay. And two. All right. And two. Uh, I, uh, I've heard that there are special competitions for people who have military rifles where those are re required. Is that the Absolutely. case? Absolutely. Could you tell us? Well, there are a number of them. They have vintage, so there are, there are competitions where you have to use vintage military, like the M1 Garand, or they have bolt action competitions. So, so the, the uh, what is it, the OT, the, uh, uh, what's the bolt, the OT-3, 19 OT-3 Springfield, big competitions around the country for that particular gun, as mm -hmm. well as the Garands and the Carbines. Very, very popular, and, and they only allow certain firearms. You have to be within a certain, I believe it's a date range, not, not a specific firearm, but a date range, mm -hmm. Vietnam era or, or World War II era, and, and those competitions are very popular. Wasn't the government at, at, at one point promoting that and, 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 and buying ammunition for, for certain types of competition? They still do indirectly. Uh, the civilian marksmanship program inherited uh, the gun sales of surplus firearms by the U.S. government to civilians. Uh, because Congress changed the rules, uh, so a nonprofit called the Civilian Marksmanship Program took over distribution of those firearms, uh, parts, and ammunition. Uh, they're very popular. Okay, well, did the government support it because they decided it was in their best interest? I mean, uh, is the government on one side saying, well, we should restrict these firearms, but on the other side saying that we would like you, we would like you to, be, to maintain currency in there for their own purpose? Well, the government supports uh, riflery uh, among the population. This was the reason the NRE was founded back after the Civil War. Some uh, uh, Civil War generals got together and said, well, we're really disappointed in the uh, gun handling capacity of most troops, and we'd like to see better. So let's start an association to teach marksmanship. And you need firearms to do that. So uh, our federal government has been supportive in that. And of course, the Second Amendment was set up to, to promote uh, mm -hmm. the, the fact that the civilian militia, which is the majority of us, would be able to protect themselves, protect the nation, protect their community in a militia perspective. And so the flow of those firearms into, into civilian hands was part and parcel to that. Hey, Dean, you'll, you'll be happy to know that you have to have a background check and submit fingerprints in order to buy one of these CMP rifles. Okay. Well, I, w I just, I've, my, from the moment I was born, I've lived with a hunter. I still do, and I don't know any one of them who would want to go into the woods hunting and knowing that there's somebody out there with a semi-automatic or fully automatic weapon. Ooh, none of them are going to go hunting then, because they're, they're out there en masse. Well, I'm just saying that it, it spooks them to know that there's people out there just blasting away with their fully automatic weapons. We don't weapons. blast away with If you fully can't automatic kill weapons. something in two or three, uh, you know, a ten-round clip, Go home. Nadine, our game wardens use them for controlling feral pigs. I know that. Yeah. And you can't hunt with a 10 round clip either. I you, know you a lot of people. You have to have a limited, a limited clip depending on the game. My husband's family used to send him out with one bullet and he had to come home with dinner. So <laughs> I begged to tell did, he ever wound an animal, did he ever wound an animal that got away without a quick second shot? <laughs> He's saying no, <laughs> no. <laughs> He's no. an excellent hunter there. He but is. that does happen, and you always need to be prepared to take a follow-up shot if you're a, a legitimate ethical, ethical hunter. Agreed. Uh, and that can be done with a bolt action, certainly. Okay, I, I have another question here. You, you mentioned going through a, a background check to, to acquire these firearms or, or any firearms. And uh, um, uh, I had an occasion where a friend of mine was next door to, to uh, well, her neighbor was murdered, and she was called in as basically the number one witness for the prosecution. And she had no firearms, uh, not very much experience at all with firearms. And so the question came up, what does it take to, to acquire a firearm? Now, if she wanted to go and acquire a firearm for her protection, what does the current law require in order for you
to purchase a firearm? What, what do you have to go through? Well, in Hawaii, there's a, there's a pretty... And how long does it take, too? It's yeah. a pretty involved process in Hawaii. Okay. So there, there's, it's a two-level process. There's a handgun process and there's a rifle process. Okay. So let's say you wanted to, to buy a long gun or a rifle. So long guns are shotguns and rifles. Mm -hmm. So you go down and you apply for a permit to acquire. And that's a permit to acquire long guns only, not pistols. Mm -hmm. And in that, you're going to have to provide who your medical doctor is and, and sign a release that they can query your doctor. They're going to query the, you have to sign a release for the health department so that the health department can be uh, asked, do you have any mental health issues? And you're going to have to pay an FBI background check of $16.50. That's today, no changes. That's what it is today. Now. You've gone down and you've stood in line and you've gotten all that done and you go away and two weeks later you come back and if you had passed all of that and had no issues with mental health, TROs, temporary restraining orders, any of that, they will issue you that permit. Okay. Now with that permit, you can go out and buy as many firearms as you can afford, long guns. Okay. That doesn't include pistols. For pistols, you're going to need to go down and select a pistol at a gun store, wherever you... First of all, training. Well, that's true. You'll have to have training before they give it to you. With, with handguns, you have to have taken a, a six-hour handgun safety class, which we support fully. And our sister organization, Lessons in Firearms Education, puts that on. Max and his wife created that organization how many years ago, Max? Mm, about 20. 20 years ago. It's a fantastic organization that trains people. It's not for profit. It is not done for a profit motive. It's only done to get people properly trained in the operation of a handgun. So you get the training, you select the gun, you pay for it, they give you a receipt. You go down to HPD and you're going to go through that same process again. You're going to wait two weeks and then you're going to come back and you're going to pick up the permit to acquire handgun. You're going to take that to the gun store. You're going to fill out more paperwork, federal paperwork with them. So you've gone through all the background checks, you've gone through the FBI check. Now you're going to take the gun back to HPD and you're going to register it. So we've got three trips in there. Okay, how long does it does this take? Okay, I, I'm weeks. just I'm just using the example of, of my friend who had a legitimate reason here, and I, I I've known of other instances where perhaps a woman is is threatened by by somebody, and for a woman it. I think it's a scarier process sure. than a man. So uh, disparity of force, and, and they're they're right. Uh, they are less likely to be familiar with firearms. So if if they're going to go through this process, and I'm going to come to Nadine in a second and ask her how she feels about this in terms of of current Hawaii law, but to to walk somebody through the process here because that was kind of long and involved. You're saying that they basically go and sign up for a class. Okay, so let, let's say uh, from, from day one, somebody decides that they want to buy a firearm, they want to buy a handgun to put it in a drawer okay. because they, 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 they feel threatened. Now, I won't get into the safety right now because obviously somebody shouldn't just take a firearm and stick it in a drawer. It's they, a locked drawer. Right, okay. <laughs> what, what, uh, what are they going to need to do? They, they go and they get the training first? Right, they have to take the training. So and how long is that take? They're going to have to sign it's up for the most class. Most of the classes are backed up two, two months. Yep. Okay. So somebody has an urgent need for a firearm, it's going to take them two months to get the training? Good. What you're working at, I think, is that one of the things that we need to improve in Hawaii state law is to have an exemption for people who are threatened. Okay. Is that realistic? Uh, probably coming up. I think it, it was going to happen sooner than concealed carry here. Okay, if they were to ask somebody who was, say, a, a trainer, they could perhaps get training faster. Now, there's still, there's still a process they have to go through. Well, they should be able to go to HPD and say, I'm threatened, I, I want training now, and I want a quick background check, and you can take two weeks to talk to my doctor, but I need the firearm now, what do you say? And the police chief ought to have the authority to say, I agree with you, you need to have a firearm. So that would be discretionary for the... Uh, the police chief or somebody in the police department. If it was written if, in the law. If that, that were way. put in. Right right now, okay, assuming assuming somebody is able to get the, the training quickly, which it sounds like that's a really big Well it's assumption. possible. There are independent instructors out there that might be able to do it quicker. Okay. From from that point, how long does it take? I'm looking at the number of hours it costs somebody from from, from day one 
and, and until they have a firearm, how long does that take? Well, let's say you signed up on Friday for the class and you went to the, the class on Saturday. It's a one-day class, six hours plus a lunch break. Okay. So then come on Monday, they could go and buy the firearm, it, as long as they were certified. They okay. had to pass the class. Then they could go buy the firearm, take the receipt back to HPD, and file for the permit. That takes two weeks. So that's the, what's called the cooling off period in the old jargon it was called a cooling off period so if I was mad at you mm -hmm. I couldn't go buy a gun and come and hurt you with it because I hadn't cooled down yet so but cooling the, off is probably a misnomer it's really just time to so that you can do the medical background check right. by sending a letter to your doctor people uh, who have a hundred guns home in their st state still say you still it. have to do two weeks wait for their farm so so even if you've already been checked out once Twice, three, four, a hundred. Okay. Doesn't matter. So, Same exact process. Okay. Now, let, let's go back to the time it takes. Uh, you said you go and you stand in line at the police station. How, how long does it take to do that? Well, currently it's been five hours each time. You know, okay. From three to five hours. Have you time. done that yourself recently? Yes. Okay. And you, you stood there in line for five hours. Yeah, and I thought I was being very clever because I had several guns I wanted to register and the line came out of the office across the entire front of the Baratani police station, down the ramp and down the street. And I said, well, I got a business to run, I can't do that, so I'll, I'll be real smart and I'll come back at five in the morning. So there's no business going on, I know my clients aren't calling me at five in the morning, so I'll get there at five in the morning and I'll be first in line. How wrong I was. The last time I went in for a permit, uh, the guy in uh, the front of the line was asleep in a sleeping bag at midnight in front of the door. <laughs> That's how bad it is. Okay. They have not fixed that problem. And it's a problem that we're asking the city council to correct by opening up a second registration point in Kapolei at that beautiful new police station out there. Mm -hmm. That would take a lot of the, of the stress off of this. People are going to buy the guns, whether it takes them five hours to go through the line or it takes them five minutes. That's not going to slow down the, the, the purchasing of firearms. Okay, we, let's, let's we don't understand why it's Oahu that only has one place, right. the, the main station. The Big Island has six locations where you can get permits or register. Okay. Uh, you can register on Lanai. You don't have to go to Maui. So is that purposeful? Okay, I want to bring Nadine in and Nadine in, in, in just a second, but but I want to I want to finish this. So so you've gone to the police station, you stood in line for five hours, you gave them a bunch of forms, okay? Which you're not allowed to pre-fill out. That's another hitch in this. You system. have to fill it out. You should be able to download them on the internet, bring them filled out, and hand them to them as you walk in okay. the door. Okay, uh, what do you do next? Are you getting fingerprinted? Are you getting photographed? Fingerprinted. Are you signing your life away on? And then you oh. sign the forms that say they can talk to your doctor, they can talk to the health department. We, don't, we don't object to that. Is that like a release from HIPAA standards? Because HIPAA... For the purpose of that uh, inquiry into your suitability to own firearms. That's okay. All. That's okay. all they release. Yeah. All right. Now, are you For, done at that point? No. Well, there's no. an affidavit that you have to sign. Uh, okay. Saying who you are, what your hair color is, where you live, and uh, that you have no history of uh, criminal background or mental health. And if you okay. lie on those two, it's a Class C felony. And why aren't we prosecuting all those people, that 3% that went through? Do you ever see the prosecutions of that? No. Okay. We want to see those people prosecuted. Okay. Now, let's back up. You took the class. You waited in line and, and filled out all the forms. Uh, and you get photographed and fingerprinted. Now what do you do? You wait two weeks. Two weeks. And then what? And then you can go get the permit to acquire. Okay, so you go back to the police station? And, and that could be another five hours. Now I have to say the police department has been good about coming out and saying, is there anybody just here picking up a permit? Okay. And then they've, they've facilitated that. So it might only be an hour and a half or two hours. Okay. Now you go pick up the firearm from the, from the gun dealer. Okay, now you're good to go or you have no, to? Oh, no. Okay. Now you take the firearm back and you stand in that five hour line Okay. And you get up and you register your gun. If you don't get there by, if you're not inside the building by two o'clock, they're not going to get to see you anyway because they close at four thirty. Mm -hmm. So you could stand in line for a long time and, and not and, get in. And okay. People yeah, get right. turned away. All right, all right, we got the general idea. Great, thank you. Now, Nadine, from the standpoint of, of somebody, uh, you're in favor of relatively aggressive gun control laws. How do you feel about where Hawaii is right now? Is this a reasonable standard? Could it be better? In, uh, uh, are you okay with this, I guess? 
oh, it can always be better. Mm -hmm. It could always be more efficient. It mm -hmm. could always be more thorough. Okay. I mean, we all ag agree on that. I think that the fact that people do slip through the cracks is, is oh, horrendous. Mm -hmm. And it's awful that any of us have to stand in line to vote or to get your gun permit. And I, it, it's a terrible inconvenience. Mm -hmm. But I'll match that up with the inconvenience of having a funeral any okay. day. It was very expensive and it was very inconvenient. I guess what I'm asking... I had to make several okay. trips to town right. before that was done. Gotcha. So I'll, I'll match that up with the inconvenience. Okay. I'm terribly sorry about how inconvenient it was and you had to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning. And so, you know, poor thing. No, no my, my, my question <laughs> I'm is... I'm not looking for sympathy. Right. Are, oh, it I'm, sounded I'm looking like for it. the system to work better. Are, are you, do you feel that the, the residents of Hawaii are, are reasonably protected by the system as it exists right now? Obvi obviously the system could be more efficient, but do you feel that, that, that there is adequate oversight here? Or, uh, We're so much better than most other states. I'm proud of us for that. And the, the only thing that uh, I guess um, we all, we all can agree on. It's like we were talking about the legality. Again, I'm sorry to bring it back to my own experience, but. That's okay. But the man who was uh, suspected of murdering my son, uh, it's still an unsolved murder, um, he had taken out the first part. He'd gotten a permit to acquire on a gun he already owned, and he never fulfilled that um, process. Okay. To, actually get the permit and so oh, all the guns that were confiscated this huge armory that he had that type he had, he had three, of three he had three guns no that no. was his huge armory no 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 and one in california that his lawyer had that's what yeah. that's the newspaper report that i have from from that time i'll show it to you if you want well it i watched them take out three hand trucks loaded yeah, to the top. So he was a reloader. He had lots of reloading equipment and, and ammunition supplies uh, and okay. re reloading supplies. But he had the legal right because he gave that particular gun to his attorney under attorney-client privilege. He didn't have to surrender that gun. He couldn't. It was in California. Okay, let, let's, let's step back for a second here because you, you brought up a couple of interesting points on, on that particular individual before, which ties back into to what Peter Carlisle brought us up on or, or, or started on and what Harvey brought up which was uh, this is somebody who is both an alcoholic and on antidepressant drugs and one of the things that, that has been very interesting uh, to see here is a number of people if, uh, if people at home want to Google uh, I shouldn't just say Google if you want to use Bing or whatever your search engine is uh, if you were to uh, look for violence and antidepressant drugs you get an awful lot of hits for, for people who say that this is an issue. And what I'd like to ask, just from spending much of the last week doing the, those searches myself, it looked to me like there were several factors that were involved in violence. And, and this may be uh, your son's killer as well, but common elements seem to be alienation, uh, often, uh, and, I, and I can't, they say it's statistically significant, but uh, violence in media where anybody who is you know in a high school type film you know it's somebody who's the class nerd or whatever who gets back at the bully you know everybody feels that you know I reign supreme and I get to get my revenge on people third there seems to be an interest uh, especially now in violent video games so-called first-person shooter games where uh, basically others pop up on the screen who are targets and you're just shooting as fast as you can to try to you know, they're depersonalized. It's not like where a, a police officer goes through a course and he, he walks through a scenario and there's certain people that he should shoot at who are bad guys and other people he shouldn't shoot at. You know, they just go and shoot at everything, uh, although that may not be all games. Uh, now, uh, add to this uh, antidepressant drugs because most of these people who have done these major shootings, these are people who are not mentally stable. So you add the mental instability, and I realize that I, I don't want to. I don't want you to think that I'm that I'm saying that, that we have to watch 
everybody who's on an antidepressant drug, because like you said, it's probably only 1% of the population, but certain people do have a problem and there is a warning on the antidepressant drugs against suicide and uh, violence toward others. And then you add a weapon to the mix, and I don't think it has to be just a gun. I mean, it could be a knife, it could be a baseball bat or whatever. But, it's, but it becomes the perfect storm. Yes, that's exactly what I'm getting at, is do we have a situation which is arising in society where we, where we, are, we have people where there's that perfect storm and all these factors come together here and the gun is like the, the accelerant. It's like pouring gasoline on the flame. Now, it could be something else. I mean, it could be a samurai sword if that's what they're fix, fixated on. But are we asking the right questions here? Should we be looking at the confluence of factors here which promote violence. I have a question. I wonder how many people would be murdered if there weren't psychotropic drugs? <laughs> that all these people that are depressed and upset? <laughs> I don't think you want to know that answer. <laughs> that would be a difficult one to resolve here, but it would, it would be, it would be a, a good thing for us to look at here. This is why the psychologists and the psychiatrists oppose uh, that kind of a law where we were going to have a government list of people who were unfit to have a gun. It reminded me of Hitler's Germany in 1939. Okay, well, we're, we've come to the end of our show here, and so we're going to have to wrap things up, and we'll leave that for people at home to do their own searches here and see what they can find. There's a lot of very interesting literature out there. I hope people who are interested will look this up for themselves and come to their own answers. I want to thank you all very much for your participation here, and uh, uh, I think we kind of just scratched, scratched the surface, but these are important issues that we need to look at. And I'm glad we all kind of came together, both sides here. So, uh, any final comments from anybody? All right, well, thank you very much. <laughs>